Hello! Welcome to OT the Podcast. We're here talking about watches, time and how to spend it. I am Andy Gr- I'm, not, I'm not Andy. I'm Felix. <laughs> What's happened? Freaky Friday. What? I'm, I'm Andy Green. You're Felix Schultz. Maybe. And we're here to talk about time. Watches. And how to spend time looking at watches and hey, listening about what, watches. What else are we talking about this week? We've got something else uh, we're talking about. Big one. We've got an interview with Land Rover's creative director, Massimo Frascello. Cars. So we're talking about cars? Talking about cars, watches, oh. design. And how to spend money on cars, watches and design? While striving listening to OT the podcast. Nice. Before we get Massimo on the phone, Felix, what's been happening? There's been some news. Bit of news. Uh, I thought we'd keep it a bit uh, car related for this first one in honour of uh, Massimo. Uh, Lovely. Uh, Tag Heuer recently released a another Monaco, as they want to do. Another one. It's the, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> French, this prince, il est chant. The Grand Prix de Monaco Historique Limited Edition. Mm-hmm. It's the newer Monaco with the in-house movement. It's got a nice red and silver dial. There's also a little thing in the top right corner that I want to draw your attention to, Andy. Can you see what it is? That looks like a, a car. Yeah, a little classic racer boy in the, the top corner. Hmm. I had a question for you about that, Andy. Hmm. What do you think? What do I think of a car on the dial? Yeah, like is that is that on brand? Is it too cutesy? Is it... Where? It's subtle, but it's a bit much, in my opinion. Yeah. It's a, it's a wheel too far. Ooh. Mm. What if it was a... Unless... I don't think that's the logo. It's not like the logo of the Grand Prix de Monaco Historic, is it? It's a great question. Um, <laughs> we'd, have to, we'd have to pay a little bit more attention to the materials. Definitely. I do like the red, though, on that dial. It's a nice dial. Yeah, that's quite fun. Cool. Uh, and speaking of, I thought I'd double down on my my, quest- my controversial questions about watches. Okay. With another one that is a lovely watch that the uh, guys at Watches of Switzerland America released mm-hmm. with Grand Seiko. Yes. It's uh, GMT. I don't know what the reference is off the top of my head because... It starts with an S, probably. There's probably a B and a 2 somewhere in there. Um, it's uh, the dressier GMT, so it's got that beautiful green dial with the, the mm. golden GMT, and it's a, it's a great watch. It's got a lot of positive uh, attention from the internet. Mm-hmm. But my question is, too many Grand Seiko limited editions? Look, there's a lot. You, it- you drop one in a watch matchmaker recently that was like a 2015 limited to the, I don't know what market, American Who market. Who knows? Um, but this is sort of a bit of a loaded question because I've got an opinion on it. Oh, okay. I think people are giving them a bit of, bit of you sort of see on the, the internet, you see a bit of flack about mm. the LEs, but I just think it's part of the business model. Like it works, no one, you know, everyone sort of expects it from Amiga or from, from Breitling or Hublot, but. Panerai. You know, yeah. when Grand Seiko, which, you know, previously everyone loved for their indie cult status and now doing the mainstream game, people start to mm. have thoughts. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I have something on my wrist. What do you got? Ooh, oh, yeah. Andy Green. That's not a. That's not your usual cheeky boy. Cheeky boy. One of them. Uh, it is a Ublo Spirit Ublo. of Big Bang Titanium Moon Face. Nice. Is it? That's forty-two. Forty-two. Nice. Perfect size. That is an underrated watch, I would say. Yeah, so I've had it for about a week now at the, the time of recording. Yep. Uh, rubber strap, sort of the integrated rubber strap is really cool. Uh, the 42 millimeter case wears nicely. I'm enjoying yep. that sort of the flexiness of the, I guess it's a tonneau cape. Yeah, it's a tonneau. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, tonneau case. It's uh, French for barrel. Yeah. Um, enjoying the moon face, that sort of open verk dial as well. Uh, open verk? Yeah. Is that yeah. Open verk? I've not owned a open verk before. Is this, this would be like a. This is probably your the flashiest. I can't like this is a yeah. really sort of statementy. Yeah, yeah, I know. You know, out there, Andy Green. How, what, do you think has it changed your behaviour at all? Like, are you sort of, you know, you you in the car park, you head towards the Ferrari, maybe? Yeah, I'm <laughs> heading towards Ferraris. I'm leaving bigger tips when I Ooh. go places. Yeah. Uh, bottle service, bottles. Yeah, lots of popping of bottles. <laughs> uh, I'm definitely around more yachts. <laughs> uh, and and rappers, so yeah, no, no, no. I'm 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 really into it. I think it's a really cool kind of interesting yep. piece. Uh, retail in, in Aussie dollars is I think twenty six thousand with change. So titanium, titanium moon face, cool looking unique. Watch. Oh, this is this is a tricky question. If you were in a position to, and everything else was right with the world, mm. would you cop it? I'm I'm undecided yet, only because it is forty two, but it's it's thick. Okay. It's quite si- quite thick, so that's where I'm still still thinking. What about if it was gold? 
Yeah, okay. <laughs> Done. Oh, the rainbow one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in. And I've got another little one that, um, that I should I want to chuck in there. And I've sort of, I might have to pull up my phone for this one because it was an email that came in overnight. It's uh, Do you know J.N. Shapiro? Yes. So he's LA watchmaking guy, real sort of hand, mm. excellent, beautiful dials, a lot of guilloche stuff. Pops up every now and then. Yeah, uh, our, our, our collective mate Roman. Well, I guess mine. I don't know if you're, he's your mate. If you, you can claim Roman. ownership oh, of Roman. Yeah. Okay, well, we, you know, he wasn't built in a day, but I'll do it. Um, he's got one that he sort of got recently, but they've also done one for Collective, which is that Facebook group. Huh. Do you, uh, that, huh. Yeah, they've they've sort of done a bit, and uh, Asher Rapkin, I think, who we've sort of engaged with on the internet in the past. He's involved with it. So it's sort of like this vaguely semi-pro Facebook group and they've got a bit of buying power. They do like limited editions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've done, I think, a meteorite dial. Okay. Jane Shapiro. That looks really cool. And hopefully this comes out after embargo. Because mm. it's, I think it should. Well, by the time you've found the, the image that you're referencing in, <laughs> in our show notes, I, I imagine it's, uh, it's out. No, look, it's a very visual medium. Uh, what have we got? Look at this. See how this guy, Andy, look at the, I think it's a meteorite. Did I say that already? Look at that. Is that meteorite? Mm. That's cool. Yeah, it's sort of like inset, so it's on the whole dial. Link, uh, link that up and post that to social. That's maybe it's, not, maybe it's a meteorite effect. I should get my facts straight before I talk about stuff on yeah. the internet, shouldn't I? This is why we have show notes. Yeah, okay. Uh, awesome. All right, well, have you liked anything lately? Yeah, I have actually. Okay. Why are you I've, looking at me like that? Um, well, because I've got, I've got two options, but I'm going to go with the timeless one because it's what is in the show notes, believe mm-hmm. it or not. It's an Instagram site called Thing Testing. Okay. Do you know what Thing Testing is? I'm guessing it's around testing things. Nice. Hang on. I've, my, my computer's frozen. Um, anyway, it's an Instagram account that was started a little while ago by a VC, uh, so a venture like capitalist sort of funding a lady named Yeni, Yeni Galanda, who's from some part of Scandinavia. Mm-hmm. And it's a really interesting. So it's real, you know, Instagram, a lot of like those soft palettes, really cool brands, like that house drink brand and all this sort of, you know, direct to consumer mm-hmm. stuff. But she reviews it in a really thought through way. It's not like a paid advertorial. Okay. And like she spent like three months uh, testing like insect repellent. Right. And so it's like, re- so it's a whole range of things. There's no particular focus. It's all, you know, useful things in your life, like drinks or mattresses or whatever it is. But really rigorous and really sort of open okay which is really refreshing and from a uh, someone that you know does product reviews every so often i find it a really yeah. interesting way of doing it and she also provides notes on so it started as instagram and it's turned into more of a, a site and she's got mm-hmm. some money so it's growing it's getting getting a bit of buzz but she also prof- provides perspective as a user and as a potential investor okay. so she says both sides like the business side and the the public side so it's a really interesting site and i'd you know highly recommend checking it out and you might even discover some new cool stuff we should uh get any on to chat watches watch review know, um, maybe yeah, yeah well, maybe the take. art of the review yeah know. that's an interesting one that's yeah. quite a controversial topic at the i moment. think she's maybe a bit too cool for us a review versus a hands-on this sounds like a true review of a product. yeah so i mean and that's uh, yeah that's why i like it so mm. you know i don't necessarily love everything she talks about or it's not relevant to me but the method is is what it's all about, and that's at thing testing on Instagram. All right, we'll have to uh, link it up and check it out. Have you been liking anything, Andy? Oh, I've liked something. What have you liked? This is uh, it's not a review; it's an exploration mm. of double signed watches by the folks over at a collected man. Seven thousand words on the topic of double signed watches, Felix. Do you know what a double signed watch is? Yes. So, for those who don't, it's a obviously you have your retailers sign on a say it's a rolex and then hang on no no, it's the other way around we have your manufacturer you have your manufacturer and the retail and your retail sorry i said retail uh so you have your manufacturer and then the retailer or whoever also signs the dial like a tiffany patek tiffany patek correct uh and it turns out there's quite a bit of history to this topic Uh, and a collected man the team there have kind of dove deep into you know why it's important and why it adds value and you know, the first kind of point that I can pull out is that it adds a lot of provenance to an otherwise sort of, uh, you know, unknown element of a watch. Like you buy a vintage watch from the 40s or the 50s, you don't really know where it was first sold, if it doesn't come with the papers and all that sort of stuff. But by having that sort of second signature, you kind of at least know, mm. well, this was sold by, it's a Patek with a Tiffany dial and it must have been North America. So it's at least originated there. And then you can kind of begin the journey. 
Uh, they then sort of break down, I think it's like the six or seven most important double signing or, or retailer kind of signatures on dials, which is also, you know, super interesting. Um, and it just becomes one of these rabbit hole of like oh. a topic that you didn't know that you needed to know, but you do need to know about. Huh. I haven't read it. I should. Where should I read it? Well, head to a collected man. We'll link it up as well. The But it's a resource. At 7,000 words, it's a resource. They've got, you know, these macro photos of, you know, the various examples. And I mean, what I really like is that they're a retailer. Well, there's retail, but mainly a pre- pre-owned watch shop. They make money from selling stuff. They make money from selling used watches. And look, they might you might say they have some interest in boosting up the you know, double signed. The market. Maybe he's been buying them on the side for the last five years. But they're so rare that there's not yeah. that many. And this is sort of really, really great content to come out of someone at a time when, you know, we just had, I um, don't want to date the episode, but we've just had another guest on talking about mm. listicle articles and, you know, trashy celebrity wore this or, you know, watch spotting from 40 years ago that no one really cares about or it's a bit yeah. irrelevant. Like every time an, a, an astronaut movie comes out, they're going to be wearing an Omega Speedmaster. Like we get that. Sure. And then you've got this, these guys dedicated to, you know, creating this amazing reference, sort of like what Hodinkee do with the reference point mm. content that just sort of, you know, I see something like that and it kind they, of... They expand the, the field. Yes. Or they, you know, they, some maybe, maybe, you know, people know this stuff, but in separate places and they're making it more accessible and they're making, they're elevating everyone. Exactly. I think... L- Long form's back, baby. Oh, nice. Well, uh, we've got to get Massimo on the phone in a, in a second, but we've got to do one thing first. Today's episode is brought to you by Swiss typefaces who helped make it possible. Have you ever wondered what the city of Stockholm, Google Android and David Beckham's football team into Miami have in common with OT the podcast? Felix, it keeps me up at night. <laughs> well, we all use fonts from Swiss typefaces. When we were building the visual identity for OT, we knew that the right typeface was going to be very important because they're everywhere, especially if you're in digital, which everyone is. But typefaces are often overlooked and that's why there's so much yucky comic sans out there in the world. (laughs) Yuck. Uh, So we knew we wanted something cool and something a little bit more custom, which is exactly what Swiss typefaces were able to offer. We ended up with Euclid, which we liked for its strong geometry and graphic feel. It's on our logo, it's on our socials. It's a big part of the brand. Though we nearly, very nearly, went with some of the cool, wild, experimental fonts from their lab section. So if you're looking to build a brand or refresh your existing one, don't overlook the typeface and check out SwissTypefaces.com. Felix, it's time to get Massimo Frascella, the design director of Land Rover, on the phone for a chat. Uh, I think we're going to talk about cars, design, watches, Yep. maybe a bit of travel. I think it sounds like everything we talk about in the opening line. Fantastic. Hello? Massimo, it's Andy Green. How are you going, mate? Oh, hi, Andy. <laughs> You're all right. How about you? Yeah, fantastic. We've got uh, Felix on the phone as well. Hi, Massimo. How are you? Oh. Hi. How are you doing? Good. Massimo, great to have you on the on the phone. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? You've been designing cars and in the car industry for, I think, two decades now? Yeah, yeah. Started in uh, 97 in Italy. Famous coach builder, um, Bertone, Carrozzeria Bertone. That was the beginning. Wow. So, yeah, it's 20, we'll call it 22 years. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's quite a long time to be in this sort of same yeah, industry. Yeah. Yeah, and been around uh, a few places. I think uh, uh, it all started in Italy. It was. Um, uh, Bertone is a very traditional place mm. clearly is a big name in the automotive design and uh, it, to me it felt really the school after school is where, is where I really learned um, well I'm still learning but you know at the beginning is where I, I learned all the the basics of uh, um, car design and it's, a, it's an invaluable experience it's, it's sad to see now that Bertone doesn't exist anymore and some of the Italian coach builders like, you know, Pinfarina is obviously focusing on uh, different uh, activities, uh, Gijaro. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, for designers of my generation, going through an Italian coach builder was definitely a, a, a great thing to do. And obviously you've been at Land Rover Jaguar for quite some time, I think eight years, is that correct? Uh, yes. Started in uh, November 2011, 
So yeah, eight and a half years. Yeah. It'll be nine years in, in in November. It's been this is actually my third time in Gaiden, where the design studio is, because in early two thousand, when I left Bertone, I joined with my current boss, Jeremy Govan, uh, the Link Mercury uh, design organization at the time. Uh, it was part of Ford Motor Company, oh, and uh, we were based in England for a year before moving to the States, right? And uh, they split the team between Detroit and uh, the newly opened studio in, in California, and I was lucky enough to, to end in California rather than Detroit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was my first time... Yeah, it was my first time in Gaiden for about a year or so. And then I came back uh, when the whole Premier Automotive Group that included uh, you know, Jagger, Volvo, and uh, Lincoln, um, when it all fell apart uh, as a business uh, mm. proposition from Ford, uh, we came back uh, to uh, Land Rover back then at the time, mm. uh, but just for a few months. And then <laughs> my experience in California was too good to to be left undone, so to speak, after a couple of years. So I, um, I had the opportunity to go back to California uh, with uh, Kia Motors. Uh -huh. um, and I went back to uh, California for another seven years, I think. Um, and that was a great time, great place to be, the right company at the right time. Um, they were hiring, they were very aggressive on the design side. They were hiring a lot of Western designers. Mm -hmm. They hired Peter Schreier, with, you know, who's the, um, the mastermind behind the Audi TT and the uh, Volkswagen Beetle mm. uh, as a head of the design department. So they were hiring a lot of uh, Western design. The, the company was basically uh, starting from scratch because the reputation of uh, uh, the Korean company at the time wasn't that uh, great other than uh, being uh, cheap. And if you think what Kia has achieved during these last 10 years, it's, it's just amazing. And uh, uh, so again, from a design point of view, from a designer point of view, being part of that um, brand building uh, exercise that happened during these last few years was definitely very formative, very, uh, very good. And then at one point, um, several circumstances with my wife, who I met at work, she was working for Hyundai. Uh, we were looking for a different experience back in Europe and, uh, and Jerry, who I have always been in contact with. Mm. Um, he gave me a call and he said uh, I was actually in Sydney when <laughs> I got that phone call <laughs> and it was at 2 o'clock in the morning <laughs> and uh, yeah because I was there for uh, uh, I think the launch of the uh, Kia Rio we went to the Barossa Valley Ooh, nice. um, oh, lovely Adelaide <laughs> South Australia that's where I hail from yeah, yeah and uh, so I got this call and, uh, and, and that was it. So we decided to come back. It was a great opportunity. Defender, uh, as the program was about to start, and I said, you know what, it doesn't get any bigger than this for, for, for a designer to, to work on uh, what I call the last automotive icon. And um, uh, so, you know, all combined and uh, we decided to come back and that was it. We came back to England. It was, as you can imagine, it was a difficult <laughs> decision, right, living uh, sunny California after seven mm -hmm. years to to end in, uh, in in the Midlands in England. Lovely place, but clearly very, very, very different. Well, lucky you've got sort of the the vehicle to tackle such a terrain. And you just mentioned the the Defender. Obviously, we've uh, we've seen recently the new Defender One Ten and the the ninety that sort of everyone's waiting to see as well, including myself. Can we can we talk a little bit about that and that process of I guess essentially reimagining an iconic design and yeah. and your involvement. Yeah, as I said, you know the program was just starting, and we were just talking about how to replace the um, the Defender. I mean, the business itself, they've been been trying to replace Defender for uh, for many years. Mm. You know, the car that really hasn't changed uh, since the beginning, so nineteen forty. Uh, eight and uh, so it's a you know it, it was a big task but um, it seemed like everything was uh, going in the, in the right direction from a business point of view with the architecture and uh, the business case the momentum of the company the brand and also you know the fact that <clears throat> um, for our brand strategy with the Ranger Rover uh, being uh, you know focused on uh, 
um, refinement and luxury and uh, uh, discovery um, being focused on the versatility, more uh, the family lifestyle aspect. We need a defender to anchor down this uh, uh, this old strategy in terms of durability and toughness and uh, um, you know bringing more um, the new vehicles down to the roots of what Land Rover is all about. So, uh, you know, it was a massive task, uh, a lot of excitement. Um, some people ask me, feel the pressure. Mm. Um, we didn't because if we had allowed pressure to um, have the best of us, you know, we probably wouldn't have uh, done what we've done. I think what well, what I did and what what I did with the team, uh, I encouraged almost not to think about defender in a way uh, to have the defender image next to us mm. when we uh, redesigned it. We didn't want to do a uh, a retro exercise, right? So I said, we know what Defender is about. Inevitably, some of the Defender elements will come back out in in the design that we're doing. Some of them are actually dictated by the function of these vehicles, like the very short uh, overhangs, the ground clearance, um, you know, the, the upright backhand, very short with the exposed wheel to, um, for the departure angle. Um, so all those elements will, get, will naturally come back out. But I, I, I've asked the guys and I ask myself to kind of isolate and mm. imagine, you know, if you were to capture the spirit of this vehicle more than anything else, um, you know, what the purpose of Defender was back then and what the purpose of Defender has to be today in the modern world with a society that has changed so much and uh, our way of living has changed so much. Um, so that was sort of the approach that we did, uh, that we had uh, at the beginning of the project. And then I have to say, it just came um, opposite to many programs that are quite uh, troubled in a way, in order to, to get to the idea. Uh, we got to the conclusion pretty, pretty uh, quickly. And then from that moment on, uh, with the drive from everyone within the business, engineering mm. and uh, you know, the product strategy and everyone really was uh, the commercial. Everyone was really pushing in the same direction and it was just a matter of uh, delivering it. And um, it, it did take quite some time because it is a complex uh, program, you know, as a, as a family of vehicles, there's a lot of uh, derivatives. So, um, you know, yeah. it was quite complex. <clears throat> so but it was a lot, a lot of fun. Of course. I mean, and, and so you, you kind of talk about the you know, people ask you often about the pressure and how you just kind of had to hone in and, and focus on what you were doing. Um, it was a very exciting release, I think, in the car world and definitely polarizing. I think it's probably fair and safe to say it was a polarizing release. And then I think the dust has settled and it's pretty <laughs> clearly, I think, a winner. Uh, you know, there are a few people that hang on to that yeah. you know, 60 or 70 year old design, but when you factor in modern safety and all these other things, and as you say, what actually the Defender stands for today, it seems to be a winner. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, when you do a new design in general, you have to accept that it's hard to please everyone. So you can only imagine when you go and uh, reimagine something that has been in the, in the common uh, understanding and perception from everyone for 70 years without changing. Uh, you know, you're going against uh, a pretty massive wall and, mm. you, you know, you know you have to put into consideration that some people will, will not understand. I like to think that people that have more, that are more open-minded definitely get what Defender, the new Defender is all about. I'm particularly pleased by... Um, some of the um, real hardcore um, Defender um, customers that we have here in England, they immediately got it and uh, they, they were fully behind it when we first unveiled it uh, to them. And I, I'm 100% sure this is a car that really needs to be seen on the road first because I don't think many people have seen it on the road. Yeah. Uh, it, needs to, it needs to be driven, it needs to be experienced because it's an all-around um, amazing vehicle and uh, only experiencing first first person 
um, you know, will give you that that perception and that appreciation of what the new defender is. Massimo, um, if I can ask, what goes yeah. into designing uh, a car? Like, where do you come into the process and how many other people are involved and how much does it change from that initial concept to sort of what ends up rolling off the, the line and, you know, however many years later? Right, so design gets involved from the very beginning of, of, of a program. Uh, this is not only for Defender, for any program, really. Um, there is a, uh, <clears throat> a, a whole process of uh, maturation of a program that is what we call before uh, the, the kickoff of the program where all the different departments contribute with inputs into what the car needs to be. And then we'll start developing uh, a design vision of what that uh, uh, vehicle uh, uh, would look like. Mm -hmm. Now, in creating this design vision, we have um, we we take the liberty of expressing a point of view from design, right? Which is in our company uh, because design is so central in everything we do. It's taken very seriously. Mm -hmm. So that design vision um, input is is well consider and taken by all the other departments. And from that moment on, you know, there's a whole work in order to deliver that design vision. Now, historically, um, to prove this point, all the latest vehicles that we've done, they actually have changed very little from our design mm. vision. If you think uh, Range Rover Vela is another great example mm. of that. That came out as a what we call a white space in design sometimes uh, or often design creates this uh, white space proposal that are not part of cycle plan within the business just to uh, you know create a discussion what if we did something like that but i was one of them and uh, we've been showing at launch um, the asset of our design vision next to the um, the car that actually got realized when we launched it, wow. and uh, you can, you can ba you can barely uh, spot the difference. Now, with a, a very design literate eye, you can see uh, that everything has slightly moved and changed. Clearly, because you know it goes through the feasibility process. Um, you know, there's a lot of people involved, manufacturing, and all the rest of it. But um, to the untrained eye, it, the, the design is literally the same. So there is a great, great, great value that we have in uh, in our company which, you know, it doesn't happen, uh, I have to say, uh, everywhere. And, and I think that's what makes Land Rovers really st stand out from, um, from the competition, you know, the idea of creating this very emotional design and being able to deliver them. Yeah, sure. That must be a great um, privilege to work somewhere where the weight of the design, you know, sort of carries through to the final you know, the, the final car, and it's not sort of diluted along the way. I can imagine that also yeah. must be uh, stressful, the, you know, that the weight is also sort of more with you. Mm. Um, yeah. So, sorry, I, I mean, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of work that goes into that. You know, I don't want to make it sound like, yeah, design comes out with this beautiful thing, now go and deliver. I mean, it is not like that. There's a lot of work. Uh, there's a lot of discussion, healthy I call it healthy, um, yeah, healthy, really heated discussion, particularly in engineering, in order in order to deliver things. And there are little compromises that design has to do, uh, but never to the detriment of of the overall result. Mm -hmm. you know, there's always a line which we never cross. And to be honest with you, that line is is supported by the whole business, as I said. And those sort of compromises tend to be things like safety and I'm imagining various requirements of various markets. So, you know, you have to move things and move big pillars and put airbags in. Yeah, there's a whole sorts of attributes that the car needs to apparently or, you know, according to the, um, you know, the, the, the briefing on the program, mm. there are certain attributes. And then, uh, you know, those attributes are, some of them are absolutely critical. Some of our, some other are, a little more debatable. You can imagine the cost pressure mm. on uh, uh, realizing certain design solutions. Uh, you know, it, it's a proper design development. That's why we don't like to call ourselves stylists because 
is not really dressing up something, it's yeah. actually being an integral part of creating something. You can only do that if you're working very closely with the, uh, you know, with the, with the technical uh, part of it. Very cool. Well, we are a, a, a primarily watch podcast. And one thing I did flag that we'd like to kind of have a quick chat about is the Zenith El Primero 21 uh, Land Rover edition, I think. Uh, obviously, that's a collaboration between Zenith and Land Rover. Um, as a mm -hmm. designer, what do you kind of think of, of this latest release? Did you have any involvement? Well, yeah, we did from a design point of view, we did. Um, there's some um, like light touches on the watches that really bring it back to what the ruggedness and the, the nature of, uh, of Defender. The, the collaboration with Zenith uh, feels very appropriate in terms of like it's two brands with a very strong heritage. Uh, and it started with the Range Rover, mm. uh, you know, 1969, mm. and, uh, and um, <clears throat> the anniversary of El Primero and, uh, and uh, the flagship Range Rover. It uh, continued through uh, Velar very successfully and Volk. And now the, the last one, which uh, has been an incredible su success, is taking uh, the Fire 21 um, uh, Primero in, in, in sort of a... Um, an aesthetic and also in a, in a, with a concept that gives the watch that, um, as I said, that ruggedness uh, mm. in the material choice. Some of the references to the to the to the, to the defender. Um, um, so I mean, overall, it's it, I, I'm very pleased with it, and I'm very pleased to see the result that I have yeah. achieved. Well, as a, a watch enthusiast yourself, it must be pretty exciting to kind of have the two passions and love. Loves me, I guess. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the the, the watch passion is has has becoming uh, re really big for me. I have to say, but it, it just started very late. Um, um, but yeah, the design design in general is, is is a passion of mine. You know, like I'd love to design watches. I'd love to design uh, boats. Uh, I'd love to do architecture. And uh, you know, maybe maybe I will do that in the future if I have the opportunity. Um, it, it's just something that um, I don't know. It, it's it's a way to express yourself. It's a way to express uh, some of the feeling to connect with the people. There's nothing uh, more rewarding to me to ha uh, than having a uh, you know a reaction and engagement from from anyone really uh, about something that uh, you know you've been part of uh, creating. So all all that is great. Watches are. Um, it's a funny story for me because uh, I've, yeah, I've never us. thought of watches. <laughs> I've never thought of watches before uh, when I was a, a bit younger. Mm. Uh, I even thought, you know, why would people? I would never understand why would people spend that much money on watches <laughs> when you know you can you, you can get like a, a fifty dollar watch that will do the job. Mm. And, I, and I've always been like that. I know it sounds a bit crazy now when I look back. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And in fact, my first watch uh, was um, it was a quartz tag Heuer. I think it was called Kirium. Yeah. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Yeah. It was back in two thousand and I don't know, maybe two thousand and three, two thousand and four. Um, and I said, "Well, I'm, you know, I'm gonna go crazy today. I'm just <laughs> gonna buy myself a fancy, fancy watch." And and I love that watch. Um, and I remember I paid six hundred dollars for it back then, and I felt a bit guilty for for a few days, right? Spending that much money, um, and and that was it. it. Was kind of like the beginning of uh, uh, of um, I wouldn't say a dangerous slope, although <laughs> it could be very, it could be a very dangerous slope when uh, when you think about you know how much these watches are. Um, but then it all changed, I think, when uh, uh, my wife said, you know, when you get your promotion, when you become a director, I want to go to Florence. I want to go to the original Panerai boutique oh, in okay. Florence. Why? And we'll buy a Panerai to, you know, celebrate that moment. Um, so we did. We did. When I... When I uh, got promoted within Land Rover uh, to director of exterior design back then, 2014. 
um, yeah, we did. I'm, I'm from Tuscany, so mm-hmm. Massa Carrara is, is not far from Florence, five hour drive. So we took one day, we went to Florence, and uh, it was a great experience. I was a bit, I was a bit nervous because that, <laughs> you know, we we're talking about five, six grand rather than five, six hundred uh, dollars, and um, and and that was it. I think that really is the watch that started it all. Uh, uh, Panerai Titanium. And it's a 44, cool. uh, eight days nice. with a brown face. And it was a great experience. Um, and, and everything follows from there. <laughs> a, a massimo, it's, it's interesting that you sort of referenced the, the, the Tagoy Kirium, because for me, that sort of period of Tagoy design was really, really interesting. Like it was sort of the end of the 90s and the early 2000s when you saw a lot of... Uh, of the time design. And I think now the watch industry is dominated by trends that are about looking back to the past. And yeah. Just to, and and I, I was really interested in sort of speaking to you that you've spent, you know, years recently um, also reinterpreting a, an iconic old design. H- how do you balance that sort of updating something that is, you know, uh, decades old and keeping it relevant? And do you worry that maybe we need to be sort of creating our own, you know, the the design of today rather than always looking back to the, the 50s or the 60s? Yeah, I guess it's, it's a very good question. Um, I guess watches are a bit different from cars in that respect because, you know, they... Uh, it, they've been doing the same thing and they will do the same thing uh, without any any difference, you know, like mm. we talked about this, the, sa- the safety on Defender, for instance, you know, the older one and the new one, mm. being able to drive the car for uh, a thousand miles rather than a uh, hundred miles, uh, which good luck doing a hundred <laughs> miles on the older one, right? About uh, so 50 miles an hour. <laughs> exactly, you know, with your elbow open. Yeah. Uh, I mean, fantastic car. I love the old Defender. But anyway, so watches are a little bit different. Like you could wear a watch from the beginning of the, uh, old century and just be fine. I don't think yeah. they need to uh, to stand any other test, right? Uh, the mechanical watch, as long as it's well kept, oiled, and you know um, maintained, and it, it will work. So I think for uh, going forward for watches, I think it's it's a, I probably don't know how to answer this question. I think uh, um, I would say I would just leave the. the the so-called icon as they are, mm. you know, uh, probably not even not even a reason to change them. But then I would uh, I would encourage to have that Royal Oak moment, right? I would encourage yeah. uh, the, the the various brands to come up. Yes, keep your old ones. In fact, the old ones uh, don't even change them too much. You just keep them. You know, no need to change them. Um, but then, you know, at the same time. Offer something that you know is is new. Maybe that's the that's the balance. Yeah. I will say in the watch industry, I see some um, reinterpretation of older watch that are nowhere near. You know, you see they're like very close, but they're not. So just just leave it as it is. I don't want to mention any names, but there are there are some watches that really the old ones. It's so I think Rolex is doing a great job with the Submariner. For yeah. you know, hasn't touched that. Yeah, uh, it's just updated with the more modern materials, and that's it. But the essence of the watch, the aesthetic of the watch, uh, you might argue the lugs and all that, but you know, overall, the, the, the proportion and uh, it, it, it's it's still there, right? It's somewhat in a, in, in a core essence. Um, Speedmaster is another one that yeah. is true to. Um, so, with those watches, just keep the keep the way they are, and, okay. and come up with something. Else. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one hundred percent. So, if we're talking about Royal Oak moments, uh, I want to ask you a question around the uh, Bulgari Octo Finissimo. Do you mm. do you like that design as a from a design perspective, from a watch enthusiast perspective, coming together? Is that a is that a moment sort of happening? It's it is it is a great watch. I'm fascinated by it by it, and I try it on a few times and. I do like the angular um, uh, sort of execution of, of the watch. And uh, personally, for me, uh, one of the uh, greatest 
thing about the watch for me is one of the weakest thing. Uh, and I explain a second. I am not a huge fan of watches that are particularly thin. Okay. Right? I um, I don't like watches that are too big. Although I have a few that are quite big, but I rather have a watch that is smaller in size in terms of dial uh, or case diameter. Uh, but I, I'm not a huge fan of watches that are particularly thin. And I know that you know the Bulgari is is it makes mm. of that um, detail like one of the strongest points. Uh, but overall, I think I, I, it, it's a great looking watch. And uh, again, I appreciate the fact that you know there are uh, brands that are coming out with something that are trying to do something uh, new and different. Cool. Well, we've obviously spoken about some of those top shelf brands and I know you've got, you know, AP and Rolex and Panorama and all that sort of stuff, but there's also a brand that, you know, I think we've chatted a little bit about in the past, uh, which seems to be a mutual favorite of Felix, myself, and, and also yours, and that's Baltic. Uh, w- tell me about <laughs> what drew you to that brand and what you love. Yeah, I mean, Baltic, I, it just really got my eyes. And again, it's purely an aesthetic thing. You know, it goes back to that uh, connection that I was talking about. When I first saw the Baltic, I said, well, that's fantastic. That is basically, uh, to the point that I was making um, earlier, uh, it, it's literally like a vintage watch built with, uh, made with uh, modern material, with modern standards. That's it. It's not trying to... Uh, to to do too much or too little. It's just a very honest, beautifully proportioned. Um, I I purchased the the blue dial with the with the full patina, and uh, you know it's a watch that I really enjoy wearing. It feels really good. Um, it gets a lot of attention. I have to say, um, it's always interesting when you meet people and uh, you know see their eyes going to your wrist or more than once when they can't get. <laughs> when they can't understand what watch you're wearing, um, yeah, the Baltic. I think it's it's a fantastic it's a fantastic watch. I've seen that they just released the bronze one, um, which I would love to see in, in person. Sure, and I a hundred percent agree with you. It's you've you've really said it. You know, I don't have a design background or anything, but it is. It's not pretending to be anything more. Mm. And and for me, I think they've really just nailed the proportions. Like it's not too big. It's, it's 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 a beautiful watch to wear. And that, you know, like you said, the, the the Land Rover is the Defender is a car that you need to drive. Mm. I think that's the same with many watches. You can see it in a photo, and that's one thing, but you need to really try it on to appreciate it fully. Absolutely, um, absolutely. I, I I heard earlier you were saying you were mentioning you would like to maybe design a watch one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What is that something you've ever sort of? Com- felt compelled to do or what any sort of thoughts as to which way you would that you would go well right okay so let me let me tell you this i started uh, getting into designing cars incredibly late now if you ask any or i would say a 99.9 percent of the car designers in the world mm. and you would and you talk to them they will tell you oh when i was a little kid i was doing little sketches, you know, I, I was just drawing cars, blah, blah, blah. I didn't have any of that. Right? I didn't really care much about cars. Um, it just happened. This is very funny. My dad, when I was about 17, <clears throat> my dad had to change a car. So we were going through dealers and look for cars. And then we ended up buying a Nissan Primera okay. 1989, right? Which at the time was Great car for us, fantastic. Uh, and the fact that I was going through dealers, uh, it, it kind of started something in me. And uh, I've always been into um, drawing. Uh, I did oil painting classes when I was little. So I kind of combined the two things. And I started drawing cars, right? just for me, just for, just for fun. And it was just people that were telling me, dude, you have to show this to someone, right? Because I think you got something in there. Okay. And that's how it all started. I went to a school or show. So watches would be the same. And I said, I've never really been into watches but in mm. the last five years. Uh, you know, it's, it's becoming not an obsession because I try to calm it down, but it could easily become an obsession. Good luck. And uh, so, 
exactly. So it's kind of combining the two things, you know, this passion for design and this passion for watches now, uh, and combining the two things. I'd, yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to uh, get into design watches one day. Um, yeah, fantastic. Find out how and what the network I mean, is. You know, <laughs> Julien Tonnerre, give him a call, pitch him some ideas. Maybe he'll. Yes. <laughs> very well. That's very interesting. Uh, sort of one of the questions I had pinned down was, you know, designing cars is obviously, like you said, a dream job for so many kids out there, and it's just yeah. so few people obviously make it, and to make it to the point of, you know, being uh, being the guy at the top of the the team that designed the new Defender, for example, is. It's pretty epic. Uh, and so I guess you've kind of answered previously in, to, to what advice you had given, and I guess it sounds like it's passion, but, you know, this new Defender's been featured in the new James Bond film, right? No Time to Die. Uh, yeah. At what point in the process did you find out about sort of that appearance in the film? It was pretty late. This is the work that the PR team has been doing, mm. the commercial team, and... Uh, we always, I mean, we had a defender in the previous bond, mm. um, so it kind of felt like a natural uh, transition going into the new, uh, into the new uh, movie. And uh, I mean, uh, you, you guys have seen on the web some yep. of the images and the, fo- the, the footage is just it's pretty incredible. epic. It is pretty epic. I mean, it really gives you a hint of what that car can do, can sustain. It's just uh, unbelievable. It just feels, it just feels bright just feels like a perfect uh, uh, partnership and how did it feel for you to kind of see that design you know or three of them tumbling <laughs> literally bouncing down the you know i guess it's, i don't know what countryside it is but pummeling along bouncing around how's that feel as a just as a i guess as a human yeah no, i mean it, it, it's 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 kind of hard to describe the feeling i mean um there is a moment as a designer uh, when uh, you know you see the car for the first time, like the first build, for instance. Mm-hmm. You see them moving around, or uh, you even see inside is you know what I call sitting inside a sketch. is mm-hmm. is is a very is a very particular feeling. It it really is hard to describe. Uh, but then when you see it on the road, um, when you see it driving around, you always turn turn your head. And it, it, I guess in that moment, it, you run in a fraction of a second, you run all the things that you've been working on um, and what you've been through to, to get there. And uh, again, it's that, it's that incredible pleasure, I have to say, and satisfaction to see someone driving something that you, you've been contributing uh, in realizing. Uh, it's just a particular moment. Uh, now the the bond clearly is something uh, even more different, and uh, I probably re- realized that when the movie will come out and uh, <laughs> and uh, experience that more in in full. But no doubt, is is something that it makes you proud. It makes you um, it, it it gives you that level of motivation that you have to find uh, in yourself first for first and foremost. Um, you know when you when when you see uh, what you've been working on and what what you know what the final result is, it's, it's just special. It is special. Yeah, it must be must be very special. And and to see how sort of popular a design it has been. I know we're not expecting it here in Australia until it was meant to be late twenty twenty. I think September or October maybe yeah. for the one ten, and then next year for the ninety. Yes. Well, unfortunately, with the current situation, mm. um, the whole thing has got a delay, and you know, uh, which is which is a shame because we waited so long to introduce this car. We introduced it in Frankfurt last year. It was getting a huge momentum, mm. incredible uh, coverage um, in terms of media globally. Uh, we managed to get someone to experience the car down in Africa and Namibia. Mm. Uh, we were opening to a lot more uh, journalists. And uh, you know, cars to the dealers worldwide. Mm. Um, but then, clearly, we had to stop. And now, you know, it's going to take a, a bit of a delay. Um, yeah, be a little bit longer. But we're, con- we're confident. If anything, after after this situation we're in, um, if there is one thing that people will, will definitely want to do, is at least that's what I would do. As soon as I can go out, just get in the car and drive somewhere. So I think that they will uh, they will go. 
very nicely with the with introduction of the new defender. It's like I've shared my questions with you because the next question I had was, <laughs> well, I, I know that you, you you have at least one of these to to cruise around in, but where are you going to drive to? Uh, well, I I was really looking forward. I drive to Italy every mm, summer. So the Panerai Boutique. I'm sorry? You're going back to the Panerai Boutique. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I drive to Italy uh, every every summer because we have a few dogs and uh, we don't want to fly with the dogs. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, we drive. It's, it's literally door to door. I measure it's a, it's a thousand a thousand miles. It's what I call my mille miglia um, from uh, basically Gaden, Warwickshire, to to my hometown in uh, in Tuscany. So that's that's what I was really. That is what I was really looking forward to crossing mm-hmm. through France and the Alps. Just a beautiful drive. Um, I think probably the first place that I'll go now as soon as I can. If it's not Italy, it'll be up in Scotland mm-hmm. uh, in the, in the summer months. Yes. Um, I've been there once. It's just a it's just a extraordinary place, and uh, so maybe that's what I'll do. Fantastic! I'll definitely go somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I think I think you you're on the money there. And look, last question, last question for you. I know it's it's Sunday morning for you. You've obviously got uh, access to these these cars and. Uh, as a, a, a young Australian watch enthusiast, I'm kind of keen to know the spec, the colour that you'd recommend uh, a young Andy Green can go and test drive and, I don't know, check out. For, for, for the Defender? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What's your... Because what's your, sp- there's a few different variations wow. on the 110. Yeah. Um, well, okay. So you can go two, two ways with mm-hmm. this. Uh, one is the more, uh, I want to use my word carefully, but it's not aggressive, but maybe it's a little bit more stealth mm-hmm. uh, when you could go with black wheels, uh, you know, the X variant with the, with the black bonnet and black roof, black mm-hmm. wheels, nothing that maybe on a, on a Gondwana stone color, um, body color, uh, that would look, I mean, I've, I've seen quite a few around here. It just looks stunning. Or... You can go for the more um, romantic <laughs> configuration, so to speak, uh, which is with the um, well, <laughs> with the silver wheel mm-hmm. with, with the alloy and and the white roof contrast, maybe with the Pangea green yes. color. Yes, um, and I would I would definitely uh, recommend. I mean, I love I love the car in gloss, but design has created that vehicle with a satin finish. We yes. always presented the models with a satin finish, and it just adds to the uh, both modernity and the sort of industrial feel that Defender has. Uh, so I definitely go for the satin finish, and then one of the two. And then if you really feel nostalgic, you can put the steel wheels mm. <laughs> on the, um, the, the the smaller width. But as as a designer. You know, I always go for the bigger wheel. That's how it is. Okay. All right. Well, there we have it. Word from the top. Yeah, food for thought. All right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> look, uh, we'll link up your Instagram uh, in the show notes so that people can find you and keep up to date with your very interesting uh, happenings, I guess. And, and it's, it's rare to see a glimpse into the sort of design of, of these things. In watches, you never get to really see... Behind the scenes. Behind the scenes, or they don't really put a, a name the to the person that designed the latest GMT Master or the, you know, the Aquanaut, or you just, you never really find this stuff out. So it's really fascinating to yeah. kind of get to chat to him. In fact, in, in, incidentally, I think talking about that Kirium model, I think the designer, which I actually don't remember the name right now, is the same designer who designed the uh, overseas. The, um, yeah. The, right. The, uh, the Vacheron? Vacheron, correct. Possibly. Wow. It's, uh, there's a lot of behind the scenes work. You know, there's a lot of sort of, if you're in the industry, there'll be really well known names, but no one else ever hears of them. Yeah. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Something the only one into. who made it, Trent. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for, for your time. It's It's been an absolute thank pleasure. You, I didn't quite know what to expect going into that chat, but I am impressed and I am now looking at Defenders. And your learner's permit by the sound of things. I've already got that. I just don't know how to use it without someone sitting next to me. Awesome. Well, that was a great chat with Massimo. We'll link up his Instagram. There's a whole bunch of really interesting sketches and early looks at sort of the design side of his work. So we'll be sure to check that out. Cool. And if uh, people want to check us out, 
check us out. Check us out at, at ot.podcast on Instagram. And ot.podcast at gmail.com if you want to send us a watch matchmaker. Or any other, you know, bits and pieces you want to chat about. All right. Well, thank you to Major Tom Media for pulling the show together and obviously our sponsors. Uh, we'll see you next time. We're out. Boom. Well,